So we had one of the athletes like, hey, what training shoe should I get? And the first question I ask is like, what have you had in the past and what have you thought of it? So I try to assess like, what have you liked about the shoes you've used? And at the same time, what have you not liked about that same shoe? And just kind of get like the preference side of things down first. And then I also um, include just a little bit about like previous injury history. So if they're like, well, I tried this shoe and I really didn't like it because I wore that and I started getting foot pain. And so I kind of combine a lot of those things from a subjective standpoint and then go towards the shoe recommendation. We got a great episode with Dr. Nathan Brown that really excited to share with you. Amongst other things, he's part of the Doctors of Running podcast and there's a lot of shoe reviews and he's got a lot of in-depth knowledge about this. And he and I chatted about his way of helping people find the right shoes and i think it's a good perspective on that you'll see why that's kind of ironic and and punny when you listen to the episode here but getting uh, his perspective on how to help runners find the right pair of shoes and i thought it was a good fresh take on that so hope amongst other things we'll talk about that and go even into uh some cool inventions for the pt world and uh other things about what we should teach runners when they first get started with the sport so enjoy the episode and thanks for listening Hey everybody, Doug Adams here from Run DNA Podcast. Uh, excited here to chat with a friend and colleague, Nathan Brown here. So uh, Nathan, thanks for coming on and uh, really excited to have some fun, nerdy running conversations with you here. Uh, you're in the fellow like uh, PT hairstyle uh, as me as well. I think a lot of people remark that a lot of our guests have that. That's not like a weird PT thing. It's just a circumstance, but um, great to have you on um, and, and thanks for joining us here. Yeah, thanks for thanks for inviting me on. It's always good to get to chat with you and learn from you. Yeah, oh, likewise, likewise. So yeah, a little introduction for the audience. Um, Nathan is lab director at Pineries Running Lab. And what town is that in, in Wisconsin again? It's in Amherst, Wisconsin, which is Amherst. like a town of just over or right around a thousand people. Very, very small town. And it's pretty close to Stevens Point, which is not yeah. necessarily a metropolis, but we've got about... 25 to 30,000 people in the point area. That's bigger. Yeah, yeah. So that's not bad. And so uh, Nathan's also a clinical assistant professor at UW Stevens Point. Um, and a senior, a lot of people might know Nathan actually from his work with the popular Doctors of Running podcast. He's a senior contributor there. It's a podcast I've been on and I listen to regularly and I think they do a great job. I think you just did an episode with uh, Kara Gatcher, right? Like yes, I'm, yeah. I'm, I haven't listened to it yet, but I really want to listen to that one. Yeah, it was fun to, I, I wasn't on that interview team, but it was fun yeah. to be able to connect with her and, and be able to hear her story. And she had that book coming out. So just yeah, obviously a lot going on there to learn. Good time of that. Yeah. 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 The runner dystonia and all that. It, it's very interesting. So, um, all right, we're going to do a couple rapid fire, just, uh, you know, first time audience, uh, some of the audience meeting it here, just a couple quick questions just to get people to know you a little bit here. So, um, as somebody that's dedicated a lot of your career to working with runners, what yeah. do you love about working with runners? What, what makes you interested in this population? Oh, there's a lot of things. Um, I think a lot of over the last two to four years, most of my, the people that I've worked with have been a combination of kind of the recreational runner, mm -hmm. um, locally competitive runner, however you want to classify yourself, but also kind of partnering with our high school cross country team and a little bit of the track team. And then now be, working at the university, I get to work with the university team. And I think what's so remarkable between from everyone from those high school, middle school, runners up to the kind of just like recreational runner there's a similar like humility that a lot of mm -hmm. runners like carry with them where whether you are running a 5k in 35 minutes or you're running the 5k in 14 minutes you you both sides respect how much work goes into whatever that accomplishment is and i think that there's this level of like you just know it's hard for everyone because everyone is giving it what they have so I'd love that mindset that runners carry into it. And they're just, you know, kind of goofy too. You know, you're going to have to like break down some barriers and like weird things that they hang on to is like, well, if I don't do that, then I'm not going to get better, even if it's yeah. actually detrimental. Um, I just, I kind of like those little things that we've decided to hold on to as important as runners and uh, just figuring out how to help people move forward towards what they want to do. 
Uh, runners just great people all around uh, you know the there's always exceptions to that obviously but the, the, like you know i i couldn't agree more about the sentiment about working with runners they're just they're so grateful too when you can help them mm -hmm. because they really want to get back to running it's a big part of their life and they're really excited about that so all right great um all right now next question so you're teaching more now you're more in a in an academic although still you know working with runners and and doing gait analysis and those things but um you know what are you most excited now that you're around young professionals and having to stay up to date and making sure that the education matches the both the current and the future state of the profession like what are you most excited about for in the field of pt right now yeah that's an interesting question this definitely expands beyond running for me mm -hmm. so i'm currently getting my educational doctorate in educational sustainability so a lot of mm -hmm. my particular research focuses more on qualitative research and looking into like needs in rural communities um, mm -hmm. kind of where we live but i think within that i think something that I'm seeing within the landscape of, of research and kind of what is getting published and emphasized is a little bit more emphasis on kind of those detailed life experiences that people have as we continue to realize that every decision that gets made when it comes to care and uh, planning care decisions, whatever, are end up being so individualized. So I like that we're trying to draw out some of these less quantifiable metrics within people's experiences with healthcare, again, with my kind of research looking at healthcare, but also when it comes to running, you're starting to see how do people interact with shoes, for example, not only from mm -hmm. a like running economy perspective or how it changes biomechanics, but also what is the perception of the person who's running and why they want to use that and how it interacts with them. So I kind of like how there's this, you know, there's this new avenue for research and understanding through a little bit more qualitative um, and trying to get those more squishy concepts to just be yeah. talked about. And maybe we can identify more things that can be tested quantitatively later. Uh, but that that's maybe, I don't know how interesting that answer was, but that's kind of what No, I'm that is interesting because, uh, you know, you talk a lot of times even about like placebo effect or things like that, or like I, I've seen a quote many different ways from many different people that there's as many realities in this world as there are people. And and what your perception is, is your reality, right? So y we experience the world in different ways and we can never really know what somebody else experiences in that capacity. But it, when you bring it back to shoes even, are these perceptions so rooted in so much data that we can't quantify on, an, on a finite level why somebody likes this pair of shoes or why somebody doesn't like this pair of shoes, but their, their perception is trusted. And we can be able to say, yeah, this actually really, like if you feel, um, this is kind of getting to one of my later questions, we'll come back to this here, but you know, when you're trying a pair of shoes on, you say like, this feels good. Okay, that's probably, you know, a large percentage of what you should be choosing with your shoe there. So I think the perception of, of uh, interventions, both um, equipment or healthcare, or, uh, you know, even your perception of is my training program working well or not, can really have a big impact on your performance and your, your abilities there. So very cool. And I think one of the things that I, you know, in one of your courses, I think it's the level two gate analysis certification course, you have kind of this matrix of factors that play into injury and all of that kind of stuff. And I feel like that's where it's, it, it's very hard oftentimes to control for all of those different factors within one study. And so yeah. having these kind of qualitative research kind of offshoots, which don't give you generalizable results, but can help you think about how does somebody, how can I think about somebody coming into the clinic? Um, because this is what ex one person's experience is like and how all of these factors ended up interacting with each other. Um, yeah, so. It, it is so multifactorial um, that it's really hard to say. I actually, here, let me see. Is this the one you were talking about? Like the, or this might be a different one actually. It's but a different one. I was thinking of this one where you had these lines between all these boxes. Oh, yeah, that's a that's in the endurance course. And that's oh, okay. the like physiological performance, like what goes into like, yeah. 
running performance actually there. Um, but yeah, whether you're thinking from a performance or from an injury standpoint, everything is just, you can't look at it from just one factor, right? I, I'm a, I'm a huge running gate guy. I think running gate is like, that's kind of where I've drawn my line in the sand and said, listen, we all need to be doing gate analysis. Uh, we runners don't know what they're doing type thing. Like it's an important thing, but that's one factor. Right. right. There's the mental factor. There's the physical factor of mobility, motor control, psychological stress. Like it all interacts. And a lot of times we, the nice thing is you don't have to change everything. You just change one and a lot of the other stuff falls into place too. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, all right. I like it. We went already a little in depth just on the quick fire ones, but I like it. I like that stuff. So, um, all right. Here's another just quick fire one. Uh, what is the thing you wish you could create? Wave a magic wand and you can make any invention and it, it will probably uh, like put a little confines on this on like physical therapy or running related or so. Like what would you do or create that would make a significant p- impact on the field? Oh, feels like an impossible question. <laughs> yeah. my, my, my mind goes to, and I don't think I have a, a an answer of what this thing would be, but it would be... Yeah some sort of device that could temper it's kind of like you know how on your phone it's like you've reached your screen limit your screen yeah. time limit for this thing i would yeah. i would love a, a device that could do that for our brains where like if we have someone that we're working with who deals with a lot of rumination on their pain or their injury or they kind of become obsessive over like one part of um, their health that might not be helping them move forward mm. Like some kind of screen time limit on your brain. <laughs> this is like, that's not really possible, but it would be somewhere where we could have a little bit more interaction with like, or even a, a bell that would go off be like, Hey, this is an unhealthy thought pattern that you're going down and yeah. creating some pathways in your brain that aren't leading to, to beneficial outcomes later. Uh, hey, that's perfectly within the question. It's like may, wave a magic wand. It could be any intervention. It's like a pair of sunglasses or something that like interprets your brain waves and says like, all right, enough negative self-talk for the day. Like go like pat yourself on the back for a little bit or go do some meditation and, and get your mindset right there. Um, I like that. Yeah. Cause I mean, there is so much aspect of the the physical manifestation of psychological um, thought and process there that if you could do that, you'd probably help a ton of people. Um, I think that's a big part and an unrecognized part of what we do in physical therapy is hope uh, showing people like get out of the self-talk, like you're not going to be injured forever. This isn't going to last this way. Especially I find this with young runners that they're going through their first injury it's funny, we were joking with one of my, um, one of my clinicians from a mega project the other day, he's uh, about to turn 31. And he had his first ever like running injury that he had to miss more than like a day or two of running. And he had an accident existential crisis a little bit about it. There, He's like, I didn't handle this very well, not being able to do it. And so your inve- invention would definitely uh, help have helped him out at that point. I think in part of that comes into my brain just with the, with pineries, we do like run coaching as well. Mm -hmm. And I think um, my coach, when I was doing run coaching, um, who coached me, one of the things he always said to me was like, my job is just to help you get out of your own way. Yeah. And I think that's kind of where I'm going with that. That's where like the, the thought process came from was in working with athletes, like how do we help them get out of their own way? And part of it's just like non-true stories that you repeat in your head about whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, like how do we rewire those the stories to be true not uh like false that are in. yeah and that's a great point about what a coach does i mean you just described a brain coach versus a running yeah. coach for your invention there and it's true and I, we've said this i think on other podcasts even here i look at like some of the top runners in the world that i work with and i would say well why do you think they still have a coach because they need somebody outside of their head to be able to tell them like we had drew hunter on drew and i were drew's training me for a mile right now i want to run a sub five minute mile um every i'm going to turn 40 soon and every year in my 40s i want to run a sub five minute mile which is a little ambitious but i'm going for it um and so he's training me and we i asked him that question it's like why 
why do you have a coach? Like you're a coach, you're coaching other people. Like, why don't you just coach yourself and save a bunch of money on, on coaching fees? But th they realize like, oh, I could never coach myself ever. And I don't know why runners think that they can get away with not having a coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Be like, why do we think that we're this uh, like great all knowing being that because we read a couple articles and follow a couple podcasts that we know what we're doing and we really should be looking for having coaches. And even if it's just like a once a month review kind of thing, just to get you right. I mean, that, that makes all the difference in the world, I think. So, and I, yeah. And I think a huge part of that is just somebody who's willing to look at your life and we're talking about running your running life yeah. right now from yeah. an outside perspective that can maybe call out a couple things that may be less healthy than they could be. And yeah. you know, for, for some people, and I, you know, it's like, should I get a running coach? I think we had a whole like docs running podcast on that question. Um, and I think one of the things that I think about with that is like, I think that the best people to get a running coach are the people who've never ran before who want to start running. Mm -hmm. Just get someone who just kind of walks you through the process for a while, help you, helps you like think about all those myriads of factors that go into being healthy and creating sustainable running habits. Like that's, that's like the perfect time. Put the investment yeah. in front, set yourself up for some sex success. Cause there is, I guess there is something fun about trying to figure out running on your own. Like I do think that's one yeah. of the fun things of running, but, uh, having someone, some outside person, if it's a coach or if it's just a running friend, who's like, yo, what are you doing? Um, just somebody out there is, is like an good. accountability partner yes. just to say like, Hey, you, you have been upping your mileage for the last six weeks in a row by like 15 to 20%, like chill out, bro. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be helpful at times. I think it's hard to realize that in the moment. Yes. Yeah. Um, so speak like along those same lines, right? Uh, you came to running a little later in life, right? So this is a perfect kind of segue into this. Yeah. What have you learned as a professional? Like what one lesson or two lessons would you have taught yourself if you could go back to that? You get started running, I think, in college and, yeah. you know, then dedicate your career to it. So, you know, what uh, what would you teach yourself? It's a great question. Um, the first thing that came to my head is that I would want to kind of say to myself, like, run where you're at, not where you think you should be. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah. I came, I was a, you know, multi-sport athlete in high school and I had a competitive mindset and all this kind of stuff. And then, you know, I saw one of my friends in college who was running and I was like, well, I should be able to do that. But they had been yeah. running through high school and did cross country. And I was not a cross country runner. I did soccer, which includes running, but it was soccer, wrestling, and tennis. Mm. And a lot of my early years were riddled with injuries. And I still have injuries now. I'm not immune to it just because I'm yeah. running PT. Um, but they were riddled with it because I tried to like, I would set running goals based on what I wanted to do, not actually where I was. Um, yeah. So that'd be, it'd kind of just be like, be honest with yourself and like, running's a slow burn, man. Like you can, you can get better for decades. So be patient would maybe be the second thing is like figure yeah. out where you're at and just be patient with it. And like, don't, don't push for things that don't need to happen right away, especially for someone like me, who's not, I don't have this window of success <laughs> for like making the Olympics. That is nowhere near what I'm doing. Right. You got so time. I think that's, I think that's kind of what I would tell myself. Uh, that's great. I mean, I think running at your current ability, I think is a big error that I think a lot of people make. They think about, hey, I'm trying to train for a 5K and I want to run a sub 30 minute 5K, but their current fitness level is 35 minute 5K. Yeah. If you run at the pace of a 30 minute 5K right now, you're going to get injured. Right. It's it, it's not your aspirational pace that you should train at. It's your current fitness level, which will build your pace. And then on race day, you can aspire to that new pace, but you can aspire. And it, it's not to say that you should never run at target pace. I'm not saying that at all, but you should do fitness. And in that endurance coaching course, like that was one of our big things is totally. test frequently. Make sure yeah. you see where your fitness level actually is. Yeah, with our athletes, we use your, we do the two mile endurance and the two mile time test to see, hey, where are you at now? I know you want to run a sub two hour half marathon, but that's in 20 weeks from now. So yeah. don't, don't start training at that effort now. Let's see where you're actually at. So yeah, totally agree. 
test. Yeah. The, that's the PT coming out in the coaching, right? It's like, yes. <laughs> it's like test, retest, like don't guess, like test the thing and make sure that you know what you're going to be trying to implement. Um, oh yeah. It, it it's so important there with that. And, um, you know, to your second point about the patients, you have time. I also think that's a really important one. I, heard this um, thought experiment. It's a little grim to go off on a little tangent here, but they say, you know, it's if, how old do you want to live to, right? And they would, uh, people will inevitably say something around 85 or so. Okay, well, if you're going to die at 85, what do you want to be like when you're 84? Mm -hmm. And everyone's like, oh, well, I want to be fit and I want to be with it and I want to be around family and I still want to travel and do those things. And it's like, okay, well, if, if you were that at 84, do you think you would die at 85, right? Like, unless you were hit by a bus, what do you, what do you need to do? And, and if that's what you want to be at 84, what do you need to be doing today? Yeah. Right. And I like, this is not actually, this is one of my goals. I'm, I'm going to go for a run on my hundredth birthday. That's my like athletic goal right now. So I have to think about now every day when I'm running, is this really contributing to my long-term goal of that? My long-term goal is to be a runner for life. So if I take an extra day of rest in, and even if I take a week rest, I've got about, you know, 2000 weeks left in my life, right? So if I take one week of rest, but I can run the other 1,999, yeah. I'm doing something right there. So <laughs> kind of perspective makes a big difference. It's funny you say that goals when I was, um, so I was a gymnast growing up as well. That was mm. my main thing for most of my childhood. Um, and then I, I had set these goals. I'm like, I'm going to be able to do a backflip in my fifties still. Nice. And then I want to be able to do a handstand when I'm 70 still. Like I have the, and I, a box jump when I'm in my seventies as well. So I have like those things as well that I've thought about. I'm like, I don't want to lose my backflip. So I just got to keep yeah. doing backflips. <laughs> you can do a backflip now. I'm impressed. It's not as good as it was. Mm. I, uh, Cause I've, I've went from those like explosive sports to running. I have yeah. lost my power. Um, so I need to get my power back, but I, I can still do a backflip, like, especially on like a trampoline. For sure. Yeah. But oh, I wow. I'm around. impressed. Um, I can't even do that off a diving board. So I'm super <laughs> impressed. There. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. Well, and it's great. Sports specific, right? But keeping those things, keeping the long term perspective and saying, hey, if I'm going to do this, then like the reason I picked the mile goal is mm -hmm. because. I know that we start to lose speed at mm -hmm. this time of our life and that in our fifties, it's a little bit more of a done deal. Like we really start to lose speed. So I was like, if I want to do anything fast and to force myself to stay in the weight room and do exercises and, and have some speed and have some explosiveness, my goal needs to be around fast running right now. Like I'll run marathons in my fifties then, right? I'm going to run miles in my forties and I'll run marathons in my fifties when it's like, okay, to be slower there. So you have to set your goals to kind of be like, well, what am I going to force myself to do on a regular basis to, yeah. to maintain that health? Yeah. So very cool. Um, all right. So the other thing I want to talk about here too, doctors of running podcast, just great. I love it. Um, I think you guys do a really great job and, and talking about shoes is a, not the only topic, but a common topic that's talked on there. So, um, can you share first, I'd be curious what your shoe choice or choices are, what you run in. And then when a client comes to you at Pineries running lab, you're doing a, uh, Pineries, by the way, if you're anywhere near near Wisconsin, great um, facility. They're, they're one of our 3D users. They do a great job with that, the coaching, the, the whole thing you, do, you guys really do a great job with. So um, a little plug for you guys there because you do a great job with it. Uh, but when one of your clients comes in, what do you tell them when they're picking out shoes? Yeah. So uh, for my own choices, I've got, I've got a few. Um, I won't go into much of it now, but I had, I tore my planter plate on my left, mm. uh, the MTP. So Ooh. I was out for like 30 weeks, uh, oh. really like being able to load it. So I'm finally back and I've been running. So was that has a backflip that you tore it or no? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> backflip. Um, <laughs> no, but, uh, so that has limited my, the amount of recent shoes that I've been testing, but in my okay. current lineup, um, the shoes that I'm getting the most miles on in are the Hoka Mach 6. Um, 
I, I won't go in, I won't bore people with the details, but it's kind of like a lighter weight trainer from Hoka. They finally put a rubber outsole, so it's going to last a lot longer mm. than the previous models did. Um, slightly, just like slightly firmer and it doesn't have like a ton of cush to it, which I appreciate for a lot of like easy miles. Just my, again, I'm, I'm a big preference guy when it comes to footwear. So yeah. my preference leans towards the not super squishy soft. I can still feel the ground. Um, so the Hoka Mach 6 and then for like longer efforts and some of the up-tempo stuff, I've enjoyed um, the Endorphin Speed 4 from mm. Saucony. So those have yeah. been my two for like getting most of my miles in. But part of that has just been what's been comfortable on my foot because I still have like residual yeah. symptoms. So if the cushioning's not right, it just feels uncomfortable. So those have been two. And then um, I recently ran a five-mile race not super fast, but, um, I raced it in the a six meta speed edge Paris. Um, it was super fun. Um, yeah, I would probably pick it for something up to half marathon distance. Or yeah. My racer. Um, so All right. rolls really well for me. Nice. Is the, uh, Hoka Mach six, is that a low heel drop too? As yeah, well, or? Right around a five millimeter. Five. Drop. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So all those shoes are that your preference is in that because the endorphin, what's endorphin the endorphin? Is an eight. Um, it's an eight. So that one's a little higher, eight. but not and a 12. As well. Yeah, just I five. usually fall in that like five to eight millimeter yeah. kind of jam. Um, the I used to run in the Wave Rider from Mizuno. It's a 12 millimeter drop shoe. Yeah. And then I think just over time, my mechanics have changed and – it, it just doesn't work as well for me. Just kind of clunky in the heel. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Nice. All right. So now when you tell somebody else to, to get shoes, what's what, how do you recommend people pick out their shoes? Yeah. Um, so it's going to obviously be super individual, um, but kind of some of the guiding principles in terms of how I approach the conversation. Cause we had it yesterday in the running lab that we lead with our students here when we're working mm -hmm. with SP athletes, we had one of the athletes like, Hey, what training shoe should I get? And the first question I ask is like, what have you had in the past and what have you thought of it? So I try to assess like, what have you liked about the shoes you've used? And at the same time, what have you not liked about that same shoe? And kind of sometimes people don't know how to describe it. So I'll start asking questions like, did you think it was too soft? Was it really firm? Did you like how flexible it was? Did it fit your foot well? I'll just kind of start probing and just kind of get like the preference side of things down first. And mm -hmm. then I also um, include just a little bit about like previous injury history. So if they're like, well, I tried this shoe and I really didn't like it because I wore that and I started getting foot pain after, you know, a month of using it or a couple of weeks of using it. Um, or if there's somebody who has like recurrent, like plantar foot fascia pain or tib post pain or some other pronation related injury, there's some evidence to say that those people who have those recurrent injuries may benefit from a little bit more structure on the medial side of their shoe. It doesn't mean they need a stability shoe, but some kind of sole flaring or some kind of metric. So I look at, again, kind of their preference towards the shoes that they've used or the things they haven't liked. Um, and then I combine in a little bit of injury history. And if they're, you know, we do know some things about shoe types will change your mechanics. Mm -hmm well, which if you change your mechanics, that's going to change the loading on different structures. And so I kind of combine a lot of those things from a subjective standpoint and then go towards the shoe recommendation. There's been, when I have the time, which is not always, it's not always practical, but I, I have had people run in two different types of shoes and check out their, I think you do something similar where mm -hmm. you check out both mechanics um, and you see like, Hey, when you're running in this shoe, you really you know, you're here with for knee pain. When you do this, you have, you reach further in front of your body. You have more time standing where your foot is in front of your center of mass. Um, you have a higher tibial inclination, whatever it is. Yeah. It'd be leading to more stress on your knee. Whereas when you wear this other shoe, you land a lot closer underneath your body. So this might be a better option for you right now. So there are times where I incorporate the mechanical changes that happen with shoes, but I don't do that whole scale because they're not super predictable. Like it's right. not like everyone who runs in a, 30 millimeter stack height with zero drop is going to have this exact change in their mechanics. It just doesn't happen. So unless I can really make it uh, specific by assessing it, I, 
I usually don't make my recommendations that way. I like the preference aspect of that too. You know, it's always answer a question with a question type thing. Um, yeah, exactly. but it's, it's helpful, right? <laughs> like what shoes should I buy? What shoes have you liked? Yeah. Uh, but that's good because if you are familiar with shoes and that's something, if, if you're not, I would definitely recommend listening to Doctors of Running podcast because you'll get familiar with a lot of the shoes that are current. And um, But if you understand and you stay current with some of the shoes, you can understand, oh, well, yeah, that that shoe is a low drop and you kind of like, I was asking you a little bit, Hey, is that a low? Oh, your preference is kind of, you like five to eight millimeters for a heel to toe drop. Okay. Well, let's look on, you want to try a Brooks? Let's find one that's in that five to eight range or they don't have one. All right, let's go check out a topo or somebody else that does. Um, so having that understanding and, and understanding their preference back to your research and what interests you in the field right now, um, that preference makes a big impact. I should also, I, in terms of my favorite shoes, in terms of brand, Topo has been one of my favorites for me over the last couple of years. I'm wearing, I wear a pair every day for work <laughs> right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But I, I think that they just, they, they do anatomical shape foot, toe boxes and they have like that zero to drop to mid range drop of kind of like five millimeters. And they're just, they're just comfortable. They have yeah. a really lockdown um they do a really i think they do a really nice job i they don't they don't venture into like the super fancy technology which is part of their ethos like that's who they are so yeah I, please I me that way topo please yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from what i understand there's no plans to add plates to anything anytime soon for great uh, so I've run in Topos for the past eight years and oh, uh, like that's a shoe I've been running in and we started selling them at my clinic actually because oh, nice. we had so many people that were we were recommending them to and there was just nowhere around here like our idea isn't to be a running retail store but our idea is that like we want to serve our clients better and um, we were recommending the shoes so often that we just said well we'll just stock them so that people can feel the that's difference true. because it, it is easy and I, it's a shoe i've run in the fly light um i think i've had every version of the fly light i'm in the five now and five actually i think has been my favorite um oh. of all of them there they've been really good and i think i'm going to try the magnify i've never run in it but i think i'm going to try it out maybe this magnify weekend four is the most comfortable upper I've ever had for any shoe. Ever. Really? Uh, okay. The five is still okay, but it's not as good as the four. So if you, I just if, ordered if you the take a four, you should do it. I well, I just ordered the Magnify four for my wife oh. because she liked the color. Uh, and then I was going to try the five, but maybe I'll I'll give the I'll order some fours for myself too. There. I think the four is worth it. They didn't change. They didn't change too much. Uh, All right. But I love the, I love the there's just so good there. Yeah. 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 Um, well, that's cool. That, that, like, and you find your preference with that. And I think helping other people find their preference and because um, some brands do change more from year to year. And I think that's where people feel almost a little um, betrayed yes. by some shoe brands because it changes so much. They're like, I just want it. I always had an idea for a company where I would buy all the old shoe molds Oh, and yeah. then you could order your favorite year of shoe and get it custom made for you. Oh, and yeah. it would cost more, but you could have, because the foam, you can't, yeah. like one of the things I discourage people from doing is like they find a pair of shoes. And like, if people are listening to this, don't go buy like 20 pairs of the Magnify 4 yeah. right now, because by the time you get to use them, there is a, a, sh a shelf life to foam. Yeah. And they're not going to be as good where if people do that, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this maybe. But my recommendation is if you're buying a shoe that's over a year out of model, yeah. I recommend people take about 20% off of their expected life of the shoe. Yeah. I, I'm not an expert in material science, uh, but you Same. know, I yeah. think uh, in the conversations we've had with some of the material engineers, with some of the companies that we get to know through Doctors of Running, um, they've kind of mentioned some similar ideas where after, you know, a year, it's still going to be in a pretty good shape. Two years, you're starting to see some detriment in the resilience and the durability of that foam. And it's not so much the outsole that matters when it comes to durability. It's how does that foam yeah. hold up? Because that's mm -hmm. really what a running shoes is 
doing anything anything that's doing for you or with you or whatever is coming from the foam compounds not just the rubber on the outside yeah. but yeah yeah good good specification with it so um well hey this has been a great conversation here um i appreciate your time coming on here i feel like there's still a lot and maybe we can get you back on and get an update on some of your scholarly work and what you're researching and what you're doing there in future episodes maybe we can follow along but if people do want to follow you along right where's the best place like where like like there's a podcast we've mentioned, but are there other places that people can follow you? Yeah, good question. I think for you know for runners, probably the the most helpful f- resources are going to be doctorsofrunning.com. We have all of our like shoe reviews are there, and that's what's most prevalent. But you can also we have like guide to running shoes for new runners. We talk about what does stability, quote unquote, stability really mean. So we have some articles across the top of the website that are pretty helpful, um, especially if you're trying to figure out what. What, what do all these terms and stuff mean when it comes to footwear? Uh, but yeah, the podcast is is around. We hit that's where we kind of expand beyond the running shoe world a little bit and get to really branch into our actual bread and butter, which is the other ninety eight percent of running outside of shoes. Yeah. Uh, so that those are good spots. And if if you're thinking about um, like run coaching and stuff. Um, Pinery's running lab is the handle on like Instagram and we're not super active on there. We're just kind of busy. So we're busy doing the thing and not so much like putting out a ton of social content, but sometimes we put up whatever workouts we're doing on there, but it'd be a good way to reach out to like what you hear, from, like, leave a review of the show wherever you listen and uh, don't forget to subscribe. So you never miss an episode. Run DNA helps yeah. runners and Highly running specialists here. through education and technology and to, to identify each runner's unique so injury profile work, to avoid setbacks and maximize results. And the Run DNA podcast is produced by Ace Running LLC. Yeah, the the Run DNA podcast is intended for yeah, educational right. purposes for only. No clinical decision making should be based like solely on one source. Subscribe. care is taken to ensure accuracy. Factual errors can occur. Always seek the guidance of qualified medical professionals. Out. We before list making healthcare decisions, sales, uh, find us online at rundna.com. Um, lots of different events there. So thanks for listening and happy, healthy running.